Hi, everybody, and welcome back. We're continuing our Chapter 9 notes on atmosphere and severe storms, and this is going to be Section 5. Now, this one's going to be one of the, one of the longer ones, although I'll do my best to, to keep it as short as possible. But this deals with the actual types of storms themselves. And um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, move quickly through some things that, uh, through some topics that we would otherwise be checking out through other means by way of um, either videos or discussion or diagrams or that kind of thing. So um, anyway, here we go. So um, so anything we call hazardous weather uh, consists of any one of these, what, seven or eight different kinds of um, different kinds of events. We've got thunderstorms and tornadoes and hurricanes. And the hurricane is actually going to have its own chapter dedicated to it, chapter 10. So we're not going to touch on that too terribly much this chapter. But uh, blizzards, ice storms, we're going to look at a couple different types of mountains, um, mountain wind storms, um, uh, all the way through heat waves and dust storms. So um, all these are hazardous primarily because of how much energy they release. And the energy can be used to do work on your house or even on you. And that's what we see as disasters. So thunderstorms. And <coughs> one thing that's going to um, accompany this is the fact that um, you have, uh, you should have a diagram, I think, in your notes. It has three thunderstorm stages, and um, when we get to that point, uh, we're actually going to sketch them out uh, in accordance with a diagram that we have right here. So thunderstorms usually occur in regions that are warm, especially in the uh, in equatorial regions. We talked about how at the equator, uh, it's warm, so air is rising, and so we have the equatorial low pressure zone where air is rising up. When air rises, it condenses. And if it rises quickly enough, it turns into a thunderstorm and condenses into a, a pretty substantial downpour. So you need to have warm, humid air um, that is uh, available to rise. All right. You need to have some sort of um, change in temperature so that when the air rises, it cools substantially. So that when it does um, rise up, it cools enough so that it will condense uh, a lot all at once. And um, and the updraft, that is when air, the air is rising up, it's got to force uh, air pretty high up into the upper um, atmosphere, towards the top of the troposphere, um, right about to where the troposphere ends. So we've seen before um, these cumulonimbus clouds, right, and how clouds tend to rise up. Um, well, they kind of form kind of like this. So here's the ground right here, and they, they, they form as little piles, but then they they build up and they build up and they eventually kind of flatten out into these flat-topped cumulonimbus clouds um, towards the top of the, the troposphere, and that's exactly what, what happens. So um, they start low and build up high, but as they build up, they produce a good deal of rain and all the other side effects that come with it, lightning and, and hail and, um, and so forth. So where do we see most thunderstorms in the United States? Well, it makes sense that they take place in the south, especially in Florida. Florida is kind of a thunderstorm capital um, because there's plenty of moist air around it and plenty of warmth as well to cause the air to rise up. All right, so these three stages right here are going to correspond to a diagram that should be in your notes um, about the formation of thunderstorms. So the three stages are the cumulus stage, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage. And instead of reading all this to you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to um, the actual diagram that we have, and you're going to follow along with that and mark that uh, in your notes. All right. So the um, the the cumulus stage right here on the over on the left. Okay. Um, this I want you to I want you to draw. That's going to be in the, in the first little little box that you have right here. So I'll erase that and I'll write in cumulus. I think it's already written in there anyway, but okay. Um, cumulus. Cumulus literally means pile. All right. Um, like if you if you accumulate stuff, you pile stuff up. So these are clouds that are piling up. And so what's happening here is is the air is rising up. And so these clouds are building from low um, uh, low to higher and higher and higher. All right. Well, in the second stage, right here. Um, oh, by the way, as the air rises, we know that it cools and condenses, and that's what actually makes the cloud build higher and higher. Second stage is called the mature stage. Okay, and so air is still rising up. All right, but as air rises up and cools and condenses, it also, as it condenses, it uh, develops into raindrops, which tend to fall down because of gravity. All right, so you've got updrafts and you have downdrafts. You have updrafts because of the air rising, but also downdrafts because of the colder 
um, water that is now falling down through the cloud right there. Um, this can create a lot of uh, friction and a lot of um, static electricity. And so, of course, we have lightning forming. Um, but pretty substantial downpour. It can also produce some hail as well. Um, hail because, as we'll talk about later, these little dots I'm drawing in here are supposed to be hailstones. As pieces of ice and maybe a little bit of frozen water in the upper part of the cloud get pulled up in the updraft and then drop down and then pulled up, they accumulate layers of ice, and so they can actually fall as hail. So it's very common, even in the summer, for hail to, form, to fall out of, a, uh, out of a thundercloud. Well, eventually what happens here is all this colder water is dropping down, and then it cools the ground that caused the air to rise to begin with. So as we, our last stage right here, we have the dissipating stage. That is D-I-S-S-I-P-A-T-I-N-G. So the thunderstorm sort of puts itself out, you might say, that as, these, uh, as, the, cold, as the cold rain and the, and the hailstones hit the ground, it puts out the, uh, the warmth that caused it to begin with. So you might say under a cumulus stage, I got some heat lines right here. All right. Well, the rain itself kind of like puts out the fire, as it were. And so the dissipating stage, you've got nothing left but some rain falling because air is no longer rising up because the, the ground is no longer warm. And so the thunderstorm starts to die out because there's no more air to rise up. So these are the three different stages of uh, a thunderstorm, and that's why they don't last very long. They don't tend to last you know, all day long or a few days. They only last for a few hours at a time. There's two main different kinds of uh, thunderstorms. One you might call it the garden variety kind, just air mass thunderstorms. That is one that could just kind of pop up in the middle of uh, oftentimes the spring and the summer and just give us a couple flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and uh, that's about it, but don't do a whole lot of damage. Now, they don't very, last very long either. Severe thunderstorms are actually storm systems that can roll through and affect a pretty wide area and can also bring some more severe um, severe weather. Winds can be higher than usual. Uh, of course, hailstones. Um, you don't want to be caught outside in a hailstorm. I mean, it can be pretty painful. Hailstones can get pretty large. Um, also, tornadoes can be spawned out of severe thunderstorms. So all these are results of the more severe, uh, more well-developed thundercloud that, that forms. Um, for Especially for tornadoes to occur, we'll look about that, but you've got things called wind shear. That is when um, when winds are moving either in different directions, okay, or at, uh, at different speeds at different levels, you've got some kind of rotation going on because you've got this, uh, that's supposed to be a, a circular arrow right there, sorry, um, because you you got some circular, is that a little better? A little bit better. Circular motion going on because of winds moving either at different speeds or um, in different directions. So we call that wind shear. It's also very dangerous for pilots to try to uh, land in those kind of conditions as well. So wind shear, uh, kind of like I just tried to draw right here, occurs when um, you have air that it is set to rotating because of different speeds. So slower wind, faster wind, of course, this is going to spin around because of that right there. Wind shear can also be winds moving at different directions at different altitudes, which, as I said before, can certainly affect the, the flights of, um, uh, of aircraft. Okay, so when we have severe thunderstorms, there's a couple different kinds of these that we can look at. Um, mesoscale severe thunderstorms, and these are ones that uh, we may have, uh, have had around in our area right here. Um, these are storms that don't just kind of put themselves out um, after a few hours, but they kind of self-propagate. That is, when downdrafts, so let's see if I can sketch a, there's a, cum a red cumulonimbus cloud right there. How's that? All right, so when downdrafts, occur from this cloud, and downdrafts are going to be kind of blue, all right, they can actually cause um, updrafts elsewhere, which sort of propagates, because as that, as that air pushes down, it can cause air to be, to be pushed up that was previously right there, forming another cumulus cloud. So uh, this isn't just a, a single cumulonimbus cloud that, that puts itself out, but rather itself sort of self-perpetuates itself. Um, these can last for, for several hours. Squall lines are interesting. Um, these are lines of storms that form along cold fronts. And we saw with cold fronts how with a, the cold front you've got a wedge of cold air pushing in. So that's the, um, so that's the, that's the ground right there on the bottom. All right, so there's the ground. And uh, this is warm air 
right here, and that cold air is pushing underneath, forming, uh, forcing the warm air upwards. And so if that happens along a whole cold front line. Uh, we call that a squall line. Um, sometimes it can also be called uh, something like a derecho as well, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And finally, things called supercells. These are just um, kind of self-contained uh, areas where air is rising all at once and it kind of spirals upwards and, and forms sort of this invisible formation called a mesocyclone, but it's really a spiraling column of air. Right? If this mesocyclone is turned sideways by wind shear, it can actually tilt down and, and, and become a tornado. But we'll mention that uh, in just a second as well. So these don't last quite as long, but can be very violent, and most tornadoes do pop out of them. In fact, uh, this, the next diagram will sort of illustrate that. All right, so right here we have, we've got some wind shear, faster wind and slower wind, and so the wind is set to spinning, all right, and kind of like a rotating tube. All right, if that's caught in an updraft, that is air rising because it's warm, that spinning tube of air can get tilted sideways and actually wind up spinning vertically up through the cloud. It's from that that tornadoes can be spawned out of. And so these are by far the most violent, especially if they do form tornadoes. I mentioned before about something called a derecho. This is uh, that word right there. That, I believe, is a Spanish word. Um, I think it refers to a straight line or something in the, um, I think the word direct is kind of comes from, from that word, but uh, derecho, uh, this is a, a line of, um, a line of uh, thunderstorms, or a line of thunderclouds that, that uh, just drop rain all at once. And so we have these things called downbursts, um, that as all this air, this uh, rain is dropping out of the sky all at once, it can produce some pretty high wind gusts. And so fallen trees, power outages, all these are results of things called downbursts. But these are just another variety of thunderstorm. Um, so those are also microbursts as well, but they only really affect people that, uh, that, are in, um, that are in planes. Of course, everybody's familiar with lightning. And lightning is really nothing more than static electricity. Um, the same static, um, the same electri static electricity that makes your either your hair stand up on end or make or zaps you when you touch a doorknob or something like that, but it's on a much larger scale. And so, as um, you have uh, updrafts and downdrafts, it creates a lot of friction and it rubs electrons off of uh, molecules in the cloud. And so, um, positive and negative charges build up in the cloud. And so when it finally discharges, that is, jumps from the cloud to the ground or vice versa, um, millions of joules of energy, remember a joule is, is a measure of, um, of energy, um, that can be discharged all at once. And so uh, why do we hear thunder? All right, well, when we have our you know, lightning striking the ground right there, what it does is it superheats the air and causes the air, causes the air to expand, all right? Of course, when air expands, um, really any kind of noise you hear is really a, a, an expansion of air. It's waves going through the air. And so this heating of the air by the lightning creates such violent waves that you hear that as thunder. And of course, uh, it travels at the speed of sound. And so depending on how far away you are from the lightning strike, you might hear a delay between uh, seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder. But um, you certainly don't want to hear it too close to the flash because that means uh, the light, the yeah, the lightning struck uh, a little bit too close to you. So um, we have another resource that will kind of take us through the finer details of lightning. One thing I do want to point out to you here is two things called leaders and streamers. And what happens is leaders are kind of these little feelers that come out, uh, electrical feelers that come out from the cloud, and streamers are similarly um, are, are, are similarly are oppositely charged feelers that extend up from the ground. And when they finally connect, it makes a pathway by which the lightning, the actual bolt that you see, the bright bolt that you see, connects the cloud and the ground. And so it can go cloud to cloud, cloud to ground, or ground to cloud. But this leader and streamer combination here has to connect first to make a pathway by which the spark can jump. Um, about 100 people killed every year, and 300 more injured, so the lightning is certainly nothing, nothing to mess with. And like I said before, we have some resources where we can talk about the finer details of lightning, so I won't belabor that too much. Of course, uh, here is some lightning right here, and so the, what we see, this full stroke, is a result of 
leaders from the cloud and streamers from the ground actually connecting, and then it jumps up all at once. So right here is kind of like an invisible leader that has taken place, and right here coming up from the tree is what we call a streamer. Once that connects, there you have your, your bolt right there. So that is thunderstorms and lightning. But also, other secondary effects of thunderstorms include hail as well. And, uh, and hail are people know to be ice pellets, and oftentimes they're surprised um, when it's pointed out that the, it takes place mostly in the summer. Uh, hail does not take place in the winter all that often because um, it's, uh, it's formed a little bit differently. So, um, like I said before, as we have updrafts and downdrafts and thunderstorms, so here we've got a big cumulonimbus cloud right here. Updrafts and, of course, downdrafts are caused by rain and hail coming back down. Um, yeah, rain and hail coming back down. Um, as ice particles get caught in these up and down drafts, up and down drafts, as they move through the cloud, they gain more um, moisture droplets, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. So hail finally falls when it's big enough to not be supported by the updrafts anymore, and, and it falls, and it can get pretty darn big. It can uh, reach the size of almost softballs in some cases. Sometimes they actually have these weird kind of ice crystal spikes coming off of them, which look pretty terrifying. Um, so again, the bigger the hail, the less you want to be underneath it. Here's some hail right here, and you can actually see concentric rings. This is the cross section right here, but concentric rings because hail is made by having rings and rings and rings of ice added to it over time. Um, and on the left here is some hail damage going right through corrugated metal roofing. So again, not anything you want to mess with. All right, and also as a result of the thunder clouds, um, thunderstorms, uh, or tornadoes. And we kind of think of them as being separate um, weather threats, but really they're, uh, they're spawned out of tornadoes in the same, or out of thunderstorms in the same way that lightning and, uh, and hail are as well. So a couple different type, types of tornadoes, and we'll talk about rating systems as well. But um, uh, tornadoes are one of the most violent releases of energy in our atmosphere. Remember how we said that tornadoes can be formed because of wind shear. All right? And if you have high winds here and smaller winds here, you're going to get a kind of a rotating column of, of wind um, to spinning. If that column turns upright, it can turn into a tornado. So why do we have differences in, um, in wind um, speed right here? Well, because we have differences in pressure. Wind also fl always flows from high to low, high to low. And so if we have a greater difference in high to low here and a less difference in high to low pressure here, you can have a difference in wind speed. Difference in wind speed at different altitudes means a rotating air. And so many tornadoes, we believe, are formed out of that um, out of that process. As I said before, we kind of uh, illustrated this, and so I'm going to walk through this uh, pretty quickly, but there's a couple different things that are required um, for, uh, for tornadoes. First of all, we need some wind shear, wind shear, all right? That is uh, some sort of rotation or like a rolling um, tube of air to take place. You need updrafts, all right? Updrafts are what causes the, tornado, the uh, thunderstorm to form to begin with because rising air causes it to build vertically. All right. As it pulls that um, that rotating tube of air up, uh, it creates what we call a mesocyclone, and this happens inside in the cloud. And it's very hard to see without radar, but we can detect them. Um, and so, as that cloud, so we have um, it's like a rotating tube of air right here. Okay, but as it's pulled up like that, kind of vertically into the cloud, it can turn into a vertically rotating tube of air. So I didn't draw the cloud, but I drew, drew the, um, the actual tube itself. All right. Um, so that's a cloud right there. So as it is pulled up, the tornado can be spawned kind of out of the bottom right there. That's a very poor drawing, but hopefully it, uh, um, it makes a little bit of sense to you. Here is um, here's a couple different funnel clouds, and um, the funnel cloud is really what everybody sees as a tornado, but it's um, one thing that really uh, it kind of helps it develop is a thing called a wall cloud. This is a um, kind of a result of the mesocyclone as, uh, as the air is being uh, pulled up. It forms this wall cloud right here. And it's, uh, that's one of the indicators that a tornado could pop down out of the bottom of it right there. 
All right, so when tornadoes actually touch down and, and hit the ground, um, it's interesting because we know that um, as tornadoes pull up dirt and debris, they look dark. But why is it that they, uh, they seem to kind of extend down from the cloud? What is it that we're seeing? Why do they look so dark as they come down from the cloud? Well, what you're not seeing is not dirt because it's, it's coming down from the cloud. But what you're seeing is really condensation. All right, condensation um, occurs when you've got extremely low pressure, and tornadoes are areas of extremely low pressure, where air is pulled in towards the center, and um, so swirling kind of around like that um, towards the center right there. And so where you've got low pressure, you have, you have condensation. That's what we oftentimes see even before the tornado touches the ground. So that last stage was called the mature stage, but we also have the shrinking and the rope stage as well. And that is when um, the, uh, the conditions are not quite right for the full funnel to continue to occur. It gets really, really skinny, and it can sometimes twist around like that, and we call that the shrinking and, and rope stage because you know, it looks kind of like a rope coming out of the ground right there. Of course, this is condensation, and this really dark stuff is debris and dirt that is kicked up, but it's important to note they are different. This is condensation, that's just dirt. Um, but what is interesting though, as the, the tornado gets skinnier, uh, it actually can rotate faster because you probably know that uh, like um, figure skaters, if you ever see them, if they want to spin faster, they pull their arms in. So as this gets skinnier, it rotates faster. All right, tornadoes are classified according to their power and they're, it used to be called the Fujita scale for a scientist named Ted Fujita, he was Japanese, but now it's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, so it's called the EF Scale. So they used to be an F1, F2, F3, now it's an EF1, and an EF2, and EF3. Because um, after his death it was added to, but it was still named in, in honor of him. He was a scientist that spent much of his life actually creating models of, of small houses, and then uh, he created a tornado machine that actually destroyed them, and so this was based on how much damage takes place. And so we have EF1, or sorry, EF0 through EF6. All the different stages, EF0, EF1, 2, 3, 4, I'm sorry, there are six stages. It goes from EF0 to EF5, but there are six stages. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. All these are based on damage. And so depending on what kind of damage you see, and I'll let you read that, um, that determines how high the winds must have been, and then what kind of EF rating it would, uh, the tornado would be assigned. Most tornadoes occur um, in the United States. You can find them all throughout the world, but mostly in what we call Tornado Alley, or like the breadbasket of the United States right there um, in our Midwest. Uh, most of them occur east of the Rockies, um, and it, they can actually take place in our area in the Northeast, but not very often. Tornado Alley is the most common one. Um, and as we see right here, this dark area, this well, the reddish area, is, um, is the highest tornado incidence. A tornado that forms over the water forms similarly, but uh, we call it a water spout, and it uh, tends to be a little bit more serene looking because it's not pulling up all kinds of debris, it's just pulling up water. Um, but these are very uh, ropey looking, like dissipating stages. Um, they don't usually last quite as long as full-blown tornadoes. So any kind of tornado over the water is called a water spout.